The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Um, so I'm going to move really quickly. I'm going to try to follow on the heels of um, the critical care OB and PEDS team who have done terrific jobs in, uh, in recent weeks talking about, um, you know, major uh, episodes of care in the COVID era. And uh, so I'm going to move quickly through a lot of slides. Hopefully we'll leave some time at the end. Um, I do believe we're having Ben Hopkins, um, Alex Hawkins, and Tim Geiger joining um, from our colorectal surgery group, so they'll be available at the end for some of the questions that, that may come up. Um, but we're gonna really talk about what's the latest evidence and, and considerations. Um, so, okay, disclosures. Uh, the one that may be of importance here is I'm gonna talk at the end briefly about a study that we did here uh, that was funded by Edwards Life Sciences. Uh, these other ones uh, don't pertain to this talk, the goal is that we are going to discuss the evidence behind the major principles of ERAS. Uh, I think that's super important. We haven't done this in a number of years, and, and yet you're delivering care every day, um, doing a great job uh, with uh, the care protocols. And so I want to go back and, and really review some of that. Um, describe uh, the evidence that we have as far as patient outcomes and our compliance, uh, particularly to colorectal surgery. But what I'm going to say today really applies to all of our um, surgical services that we're trying to do enhanced recovery for at uh, Vanderbilt. And we'll talk about the future of that expanding. Um, answer some questions about alterations that may be required in the time of COVID and supply chain disruption. And so I think that becomes important. We shouldn't be bringing uh, anyone who is COVID positive to the patient, uh, to the, excuse me, to the operating room um, for care necessarily along an ERAS pathway, meaning uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Hopkins had a patient uh, earlier this week who the day before surgery tested positive and uh, the case uh, got delayed. So um, not that you should be handling COVID positive patients um, in, uh, in these care pathways, but we could still have supply chain disruptions. And we'll have to talk about that and then look at future directions for um, continuous quality improvement in this program. Uh, I'm going to focus today, even though there is a ton of work going on from uh, the neuroanesthesia group um, to those who work with surgeon, urology, um, colorectal, I mentioned, bariatrics, on and on, uh, burn, et cetera. I, I can't go through all of those today and talk about all the different care components. So I'm going to focus on uh, colorectal, but realizing that these care principles that we talk about do apply to all of the other uh, care pathways that we have in place. Now, just to start a bit with the care that you have been delivering, and want to say a big thank you to everybody. Um, this is from our colorectal surgery, uh, VUMC patients, our outcome metrics. This was uh, prior fiscal year, uh, so this would have been July of 2018 to June of 2019. This is our current fiscal year, which was last July to this June, and this is this um, quarter, and actually this quarter right here represents uh, January uh, to March or a part of that. And what you're seeing is, is our average resource length of stay, which is really the time someone hits any of our nursing units till the time they're discharged, continues to go down. Um, and our CMI adjusted resource length of stay, keep this in mind, this is taking this length of stay and dividing it by the case mix index, which basically if the CMI is higher, the patient is sicker and has more comorbidities. If it's lower, uh, then they have less. And so this metric going down is heading in the right direction as well. Now to put those numbers in perspective, fiscal year 2013, which was before we launched with colorectal surgery in July of 2014, um, we looked at uh, their 407 patients that year. What you're seeing is the CMI adjusted resource length of stay was much higher, as was the average resource length of stay. And what we're doing now is actually caring for sicker patients um, in a better way, and that's resulting in shorter length of stays. I'm gonna talk about the fact that's not the only metric that matters, but it's definitely a high level one that we can take a look at. And I think that we should be proud of um, and the anesthesia care team with, with the care that goes on for these folks. 
the financial impact of this, if you look at about 450 cases a year, um, there's direct cost savings of um, about $1,300 per patient in the ERAS care pathway. And then when you get people out sooner and you can backfill with new cases, you can, you can accrue that to the program. And basically what we're looking at is seven digit figures um, for the, the impact uh, on the finances of the institution, which certainly those are secondary to good patient outcomes. But if we can get better patient outcomes and better finances, that's gonna let us take care of more people and continue to expand our programs. If we drill down a bit more, and you can see this is continuing to go down, uh, 1.69 and 3.93 versus what they were even just a quarter ago, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Other outcomes that we look at are readmissions, which continue to go down, and compared to a national sample for colorectal, this is a, a very good outcome. Um, the contribution margin, uh, we want this to go up. That is the, the um, amount of financial contribution per inpatient day. And you can see that's going up and mirroring the decrease that we're having in direct costs. And so sometimes people say, are all the care components that we're doing adding to more cost? And when, when you look at um, the way that our uh, financial offices, there's both um, you know, fixed and variable and all these different things. But nonetheless, it looks like we're able to care for patients with better outcomes, shorter length of stays, less readmissions, um, and we're increasing contribution margin and decreasing our uh, direct costs. And so in all three of those areas, we're really doing a great job as well. Now, we have good analytic support and our current compliance goals, our target would be that we would be above 80% in each phase of care and overall for the care components and our reach would be greater than 90%. And what you can see for the intra-op phase of care and what you can see here is this goes from pre-op to patient preparation to pre-op day of surgery. This is pre-op holding, intra-op, et cetera. We've got it mapped for every phase of care. Our intra-op phase of care that everyone on uh, listening today can directly control really tends to stay in the target range. A few times we get up into reach, but we have some work um, that we could do to do a bit better. Each program, that is each service line, uh, whether this was Tammy Freeling and um, Letha and Lane working on spine, or it's been other folks working on other things. They, they, they look at the evidence and say, what's the best evidence for care standardization for their protocol? And the protocols, as we keep building out our analytics dashboards, are trackable to the patient, to the care component, and down to the clinician um, level. And I think that's important for us to really drill into to how we're doing and how do we keep getting better. Now, compliance, it's kind of a good news story. We're having this slow increase. This is from June of 2018 to April of 2020. This line, if you extended it back before, definitely in the past was well down below 60% just from uh, general care. And before 2014, was, um, there was very little of the care component supplied. We're heading in the right direction, but have some room to go. Um, but what you're seeing is as compliance is going up, you continue to see our length of stay going down. Certainly we have some blips, uh, for sure, but on the whole, uh, the trend is heading in the right direction. And I'm going to come back to that a bit later. Now, if we look at, you know, the, the anesthesia part of this, which really talking to our department, this is, is what we want to be about today. Um, you'll see that in two areas, uh, doing a great job in the reach category. Um, uh, this really, we should hope that this would be 100% of the time that we're getting the, the right antibiotic prophylaxis in. Um, but we understand with lidocaine infusions, there may be some people for whom that's contraindicated. And I think probably 93 to 95% is about the best we're going to get for any care component, simply because we're, we are going to have contraindications to certain things like a patient being on sodalol or, or something like that for lidocaine. Uh, if you look at our PONV prophylaxis, ketamine infusions, uh, opioid minimization, which is really staying below uh, 20 MMEs in the OR um, and not uh, counting methadone in that. And then temperature management, we're more into the reach zone. And then if you look at intraoperative Toradol, um, really only about 50% of the time are our patients getting that. And I'm going to talk about that and sort of the myths surrounding whether um, surgeons approve or disapprove of that practice and some of the things that, that have crept up uh, with, with that practice. Now, um, I don't want you to think that we just came up with this on our own here. When we started this process, uh, we actually were using guidelines like this 
um, that had been published. Uh, the ones at the time were from 2012 when we were building this in 2013. These have been updated over time. The, the latest uh, edition of these came out in 2019, uh, early in 2019, so they really reflect 2018 um, literature. But I'm gonna talk about these today as well as um, new evidence that's come out for several of the care components that might be a little bit different than what is um, proposed in this guideline. But the point is we can really use everyone's help. If you desire to be a liaison on one of the, the surgical service lines, um, Matt Fosnott and Donna Keeney are really gonna be working with us on urology. Justin Lieberman and Brian Allen worked on that. Um, there's, there's room really anywhere. If you have a particular interest, we would love for you to be part of an ongoing review process. And I think over time, we've said that before, and we haven't had our a core team structure there in place the way that we needed to. And the hospital's really supported that in the past six months. And so I think on an ongoing way, we could uh, include people better in a structured process of continuing to improve what we're doing. Um, I want to talk about grade criteria briefly because I don't have time to go into all the studies behind all of these today. So that you're going to see a quality of evidence recommendation, uh, quality of evidence rating, as well as a strength of recommendation. None of what we're talking about today is going to have very low quality evidence. There's no reason to discuss that. Um, what we are going to do is talk about things that are high quality evidence where further research is very unlikely to change our confidence in how much that care component contributes or the direction of the effect, meaning is it beneficial or not. Moderate quality would say, while we think we know the direction of benefit, that is, our lidocaine infusion is beneficial, um, further research may tell us is, uh, do we actually estimate that effect very well? And that's gonna be some of our future directions here. And then low quality, of course, would be, we think we even know the direction that this goes, meaning is, is a certain care component beneficial, but future good RCTs um, may actually tell us that we were wrong and, and we have to change our mind. And that's happened over time with different care components. But I just want you to have a sense of um, what's behind the guidelines that were created and the quality of evidence and strength of recommendations that are there. Um, in the article, they call out pre-admission items. I'm gonna be talking about information. They talk about preoperative and intraoperative items like POMV prophylaxis, et cetera. In each of these instances, as we then go to all the intraoperative items and then intraop and postop, I'm gonna be pulling out the ones specific to the anesthesia care team where the care you're already giving is making a benefit and where if you continue to do this, we can really have a major impact. So information, um, the recommendation is that patients should receive dedicated preoperative counseling routinely. That is that every patient coming in this instance for colorectal surgery really should be educa educated about not just the surgery they're having and an informed consent, but what is the expected trajectory um, from their pre-op course and any optimization that's needed through their intraoperative course and then beyond, I mean, their in-hospital course and beyond. So this is actually the front page of our colorectal surgery guide. Uh, if anyone was interested, we can uh, certainly send you the PDF of this. The quality of evidence around education is moderate and recommendation grade is strong, but really what you're doing is you're empowering patients and families to know uh, the course they're gonna be on and getting them on the right page with what our goals are for them. You hear people think, I'm gonna be in the hospital for a week or 10 days or something like that, and correcting them to, you're gonna go home when you're functionally ready, um, but we really expect that probably to be two, three, or four days, depending on the colorectal surgery you're having, uh, is a real frame shift. And so it's much more functional outcomes than it is um, even just discharge on a certain day. Uh, and we really try to drive towards goals. Intraoperatively, this, it's in, important with information to also educate the team. Um, John Wanderer says that he has a dream that one day people will use this. So if, uh, if you have any love and affinity for John for all the work that he does, uh, click on the eye care guidelines um, in the anesthesia, the intraoperative part of our record. Um, you'll find them on the right side. It will bring up uh, this screen view and you have all the perioperative uh, care pathways there. If you came and clicked on colorectal, you would be presented the PDF um, of the guidelines and we're continuing to work on those to make it um, more visually appealing so we can uh, show you all the information in a better way. And so um, if you find an error, let us know. If you look at them and have a question, let us know. But there's a, a one-stop shop for you to go to for any of these patients and it really should tell you in 
uh, haiku and an epic that, that this is a patient with an associated care guideline. And even in haiku, it should display that care guideline for you uh, or a link to it. And you can go to it there as well. If you want to do it outside the OR, you can go to Spark Learn, go to evidence-based anesthesia. You click on that. Alex Moore has done a phenomenal job from the SEBA perspective, Center for Evidence-Based Anesthesia, dealing with guidelines and clinical pathways. And on the adult side, this is just a screenshot of these. There's also ones on the PED side um, that the team there has done a phenomenal job with as well. And so I don't have time to go into the specifics, but educating our team is important too. This also helps you educate the patient in the morning of when you're seeing them in the pre-op area. And you know they may be asking about the pills that they just took and what do those mean? And you can talk to them about you know that we're trying to reduce the amount of opioids and that helps their pain. It can help their nausea, also helps speed their functional recovery. So information and education for everybody from the patient to the team is super important. Um, where we really, really need you as well is delivering these immediately perioperative care components. Um, prevention of nausea and vomiting, the recommendation is a multimodal approach to POMV prophylaxis should be considered in all patients and incorporated into ERS protocols. They talk about based on risk factors, how many medications should a, uh, a patient receive and then if you do rescue, that you should really be switching drug classes and going to, um, to different things rather than, for instance, just repeating Zofran. The evidence from multiple large RCTs for multimodal POMV prophylaxis, meaning drugs from multiple different classes, is high, and rescue from different classes is high, and this gets a strong recommendation grade. If you looked in Haiku and you pulled up the events tab, uh, John as well has created this, such so you go to perioperative guidelines, you click on PONV, and it will take you right to the entire guideline, and you don't have to scroll very far before you can find some high-level charts that tell you exactly what we're attempting. And where we base these risk factors off of is what's been published over and over since 99 by Dr. Apfel with a four-component risk score, and it's uh, being female, uh, non-smoker, history of PONV or motion sickness for people who've never had general anesthesia before, certainly asking them, um, can you ride in the back seat of a car without difficulty? Uh, I don't tend to count uh, GI suite encounters as a previous anesthetic, mainly because they're getting propofol, which we know isn't, can have an antiemetic effect in its uh, own right. And so it tends to be that someone who has had um, a, a general anesthetic in a case uh, that required intubation is, is when I think about a history. And then certainly post-operative opioids, we're trying to reduce those, but in major surgery, you could still count that there's a, a possibility that they would get some and, uh, and either uh, parenteral or um, uh, IV or PO here uh, can count as a, uh, a risk factor. And so if you look at those and you say no risk factors, about 10% of patients will have PONV, um, certainly as we start to get two or more, we have a very high likelihood um, and again, for patient satisfaction, uh, this is a big deal, as well as being able to tolerate a diet early, feeling like they want to get out of bed and walk early, and really setting them up for a good trajectory right after the OR in, in the PACU. Now, one of the questions I hear a lot, though, is that's great, but you say give dexamethasone. Is dexamethasone safe? Um, so a couple trials uh, that have come out in the past few years, but I really want to highlight is one, the DREAMS trial. Uh, this was over a thousand patients that were randomized, looking particularly at the effect of uh, dexamethasone, uh, eight milligram single dose at induction versus placebo. And they were looking at the uh, adverse events as well as the primary outcome was episodes of vomiting. And if you look at PONV um, for 24 hours, it was reduced out to 24 hours, no significant increase in adverse events. And then those who got decadron actually required fewer post-operative antiemetics out to 72 hours. Now, this study did exclude patients with diabetes. To specifically answer that question, um, a group came and looked at this and included patients who had diabetes. Um, of note, they used the same dose of decadron. Uh, they did treat any glucose over 215, which is a bit high for us. We'd be picking the target at 180 or maybe a little bit lower. Um, Pat Henson's working on a new guide that will come out soon um, about that. But it was about 200 patients that were randomized. Um, the, the mean uh, change from pre-op to max intra-op was 63 
pretty wide uh, interval there, but 63 for those with diabetes, 72 for non-diabetics. Um, the mean delta glucose for non-diabetics was actually 29 uh, points higher uh, than diabetics. So non-diabetics had a, a larger increase in their glucose. I think a key take home point for this study is that the mean peak glucose in both groups was less than 180. Now take into account, they were monitoring sugars and they were treating them, which we should be doing as well, really with this being the upper limit of our target because above that is associated with SSI. But nonetheless, it showed that um, diabetes itself was not related to having a, uh, an effect on glucose uh, related to Decadron that put them into a danger range. And so yes, Decadron increases glucose. Yes, it is treatable. We have in our care pathways for checking sugars. Um, and But that really the idea of denying steroid prophylaxis for PONV for the fear of hyperglycemic response should be reconsidered given the limited effect of steroids on intraoperative blood glucose concentrations. So is dexamethasone safe? Um, the answer is yes as prescribed in our uh, guidelines, both by dose. This is a little bit higher, four milligrams is as effective for PONV, but you actually start to get more of a, a pain effect when you get into the 0.1 mg per kg and above dosing. Um, now, I think to, to answer beyond just hyperglycemia though, the PADI trial is ongoing. It's actually randomizing 8,800 patients. Their primary outcome in this is SSI rate. And so the concern that uh, it may be that the hyperglycemia isn't uh, terrible, but if there's an effect on surgical site infection, which is associated strongly with perioperative hyperglycemia, we have to worry about that. It's gonna be stratified by diabetes as well, or people with diabetes will be randomized to each group equally. So that is ongoing. And so I would say stay tuned. Um, and as that comes out, it is absolutely gonna affect our care guidelines here. The other thing that they recommend is uh, selective pre-medication. And a big take-home point here is caution, uh, particularly in elderly people um, with uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, and they talk about the fact that good preoperative education, which we've already talked about, can reduce patient anxiety. Pharmacologic anxiolysis, either with long or act short-acting sedatives, especially benzos should be avoided if possible. Now, we wanna be careful here. There are patients who come in and they're on benzos. There are patients who have severe anxiety. All those things need to be taken into account, but definitely, and, and if Chris and uh, Pratik and anyone from that group are on the, the line, they can talk to this, but we want to be careful, particularly in the patient over 65 with any routine use uh, meaning in particular, if you're heading to the OR, do you push a little bit of uh, Versed as you're rolling back? Uh, that should really be something that we're not doing. Um, opioid sparing multimodal um, pre-anesthetic medications can be used. Tylenol, NSAIDs, gabapentins, which we do, gabapentinoids. Um, interestingly, just as a note, the gabapentinoids, we do have to be careful for sedation, absolutely. Um, but if they're dose adjusted, um, based on age and renal function, like we call out in our guidelines, um, then that's really associated um, with the best use of that medication. So avoiding routine sedative med medications, the evidence is moderate and the recommendation grade is strong. Prophylactic antibiotics. Um, because SSI obviously is a huge outcome of concern to patients um, and has massive financial implications, uh, both for the length of stay they have here and a patient being in a bed for longer, as well as do they need CT scans, do they need IR drains, if it's deep organ space, or even ones where the patient has to stay here longer and get additional antibiotics or something, um, very important. And, uh, and so the, I think a, a very important point here is IV antibiotic prophylaxis should be in within 60 minutes before incision. Patients uh, talk, taking oral, um, mechanical bowel prep, that oral antibiotics should be given. If surgeons want to comment on that at the end, uh, they can. Uh, and we talked about skin disinfection, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. The evidence for intravenous antibiotic prophylaxis is high, um, as is CHG-based uh, skin prep, um, and the recommendation grade is for both of those is strong. So what's really important is getting the right drug and the right dose. Um, if you're using something like ANSEF, Remembering that over 120 kilograms needs three grams. 
um, of, of ANSAF is super important, like Brittany Raymond taught us a few months ago. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the things where we can definitely do better um, if it's cefoxetin or other stuff, making sure that we're giving the right dose there. Right time, very, very important. If you look at this spline curve, um, this is uh, some of the data from over 34,000 patients where the right timing comes in and it's T minus 60 minutes, realizing for VANC, uh, that can be a little bit longer. But if you get stuff in within, uh, get the antibiotics in within 60 minutes and then do the right redose interval, which can be found in Epic or you can call pharmacy, super important for uh, reducing SSI. This in particular, the initial dose is very important. And what pharmacy would really recommend based on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics is that we make sure it's not the last drop is in and then we cut, but ideally we're getting this in three to five minutes um, so that you're getting tissue levels at the appropriate level before the surgeon makes incision. And then the right prep. And of course, this is uh, controlled by sur uh, surgeon and nursing teams, but just very important to keep that in mind. This becomes very important as well. Um, it's become such a standard of care here. We don't have to really say it anymore, but um, in an era when people were transitioning to CHG, it was important to make the point. Um, maintaining euvolemia, uh, no fasting and using carb drinks. The recommendation is um, patients should reach uh, the anesthetic room uh, close to a state of euvolemia. Any preoperative um, and electrolyte excesses or deficits should be corrected. Evidence quality is moderate, recommendation grade is strong. If you look at the summary here, um, one is that colorectal patients should be allowed to eat until six hours ahead of time. That would be that would not include a fatty meal. That would be eight hours. I think that's in, very important. Um, not that we're going to push this one um, uh, with colorectal surgery, but with other surgeries, if someone was getting operated on at 3 p.m., they could actually get up and have a, a protein shake or something that's not a clear that morning and still be okay uh, later in the day. They should take clear fluids, including carb drinks, until two hours before the initiation of anesthesia. I think that's important. What this oh, does gosh. is it really keeps I'm our trying to listen to a meeting. It's not good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure if the meeting's not good or uh, if the, the interruption wasn't, but I'm doing my best. Um, patients with delayed gastric emptying um, uh, and others should remain fasted overnight, but that's a very small uh, group of patients. And for us, what that looks like, there's for the uh, two hours for clears and carbohydrate drinks, the quality of evidence is high. Patients, we actually use Insure pre-surgery. Um, they take two of these on the day of surgery, uh, one in the afternoon and one at night, um, and excuse me, the day before surgery, um, and then one on the morning of surgery. Each of these has about 50 grams of carbs. Most of um, this is complex carbohydrates, all but about six grams. So even in diabetic patients, we've talked about this with endocrine or not having a big bump. And remember, uh, even on a diabetic diet, an average meal has 45 to 50 grams of carbs. So in some ways, this is almost a meal replacement for them. And it's keeping them hydrated, particularly if they've done um, a bowel prep. Um, carbohydrate drinks improve well-being and insulin resistance. If everyone could mute, that would be terrific. Um, and carbohydrate drinks uh, reduce complications. That evidence is low, and so there's bigger studies going on to actually look at that. We know that it affects hyperglycemia. Um, we know that it's good um, for maintaining, or better for maintaining euvolemia. Uh, we don't know as much about actual um, improving recovery time. Recommendation for avoiding overnight fasting is strong, um, and so you should be expecting to see patients, and it's inconsistent with the VUMC guideline and the ASA guidelines, coming in and having had uh, a clear drink um, up to two hours before uh, induction of anesthesia. And we really wanna be uh, encouraging the maltodextrin or the complex carb drinks. Um, and whether those should be used in diabetic and obese patients, the evidence um, is, is currently weak. Um, it's mainly from observational studies, but again, talking with our endocrine folks and putting together the best that we can, uh, we don't feel that there should be a restriction, particularly because if someone has more advanced diabetes, um, then they're likely monitoring their sugars at home, and this is simply meal replacements for them on the day before surgery. This may be what a lot of people were waiting for. Um, I'll give you about 15 seconds to text in the code. Um, this Code is also gonna appear in the top right of uh, most of the slides from here on. All 
Okay. Um, there's the code up there in the top right. They mentioned a standard anesthetic protocol. They talked about short acting anesthetic, cerebral monitoring, um, and monitoring the level um, and complete reversal of neuromuscular blockade. Now, this is really important, and um, we're going to start to highlight uh, certainly this last one in our the updates to our iris care pathways here. Um, noticing that the quality of evidence for short acting anesthetics is low. This is more just from common sense, not using uh, very long acting agents so the patient can be uh, awake and pack you um, and uh, really get up and moving as soon as they're hitting the floor. Um, they rated the use of cerebral monitoring as high. I'm going to talk about that one in particular because a number of studies have come out that affect um, that uh, recommendation. And then I want to stress this one with neuromuscular blockade. So um, two papers that have come out that I'd really encourage you to read. Um, uh, I think they're still both EPUB, but should be hitting soon, and you can find them in PubMed. One of them was um, actually led by Chris Hughes and Tina Bonchik, um, and looking at uh, post-operative delirium, and then another one in particular looking at the use of uh, process EEG or any EEG. In these papers, which just came out versus this guideline that I referred to earlier from 2018, they say there's insufficient evidence um, to recommend using process EEG, so that would be BIS, Sedline, et cetera, um, in older high-risk patients um, to reduce the risk of post-op delirium. There's insufficient evidence to use that technology to decrease the risk of post-operative neurocognitive disorder in older patients. Um, and then from this paper, led by Matthew Chan, who's one of the leader, world leaders in testing um, processed EEG technology, um, he did say that they recommend clinicians consider using EEG monitoring to detect unintended burst suppression. Realizing the evidence um, in this criteria would, would be more on the moderate range, um, but it's a strong recommendation. And so what underlies that? Well, in February of 2019, the Engages trial came out um, that said that when using um, a BIS versus no BIS targeted um, to really trying to keep the BIS above 40, uh, that there was no difference in delirium. That was a major RCT. Later that year, the balanced uh, trial came out, again, prospective RCT, uh, looking uh, at similar um, outcomes and uh, did not seem to make a difference. And then what has come out is, and this just hit very recently, is it came out in EPUB in February, is that um, if that EEG suppression, so if you're using your BIS and you're looking at the suppression ratio, that there's some component of, po that, of post operative delirium that could be attributed to that suppression. And so the idea may not be that targeting a BIS value in particular is a benefit, but as you get into older adult, adults, at least avoiding burst suppression, which you could think of as brain asystole, um, would be something uh, that you would want to, um, to avoid. And so I'd say uh, routine use of, of BIS or sedline as we get that for reducing delirium cannot be supported by the literature right now. Um, avoiding anesthetic overdose most of the experts would say that is supported by the literature because in each of these studies, the patients who had more burst suppression, it appears there's an association with delirium. So stay tuned there for more as well. Neuromuscular blockade. Um, thanks to John Wander again to give him a shout out. He did this um, infographic uh, a few years ago and talked about myths around neuromuscular blockade. Um, one myth is that neostigmine induces weakness, uh, which it does not. Um, that strength tests are reliable, such as head lift, et cetera. Um, those are not um, also reliable uh, markers of getting above a train of four count of 0.9, which is associated with the best outcomes. Um, fade assessment that, oh, I can, I can feel the twitches and tell if there's a fade. That has been demonstrated in study after study after study to, um, to not um, be uh, possible, and that the time since the last dose is helpful. And so really the summary is that you should administer in our practice Sugamidex unless the train of four ratio is greater than 0.9 as measured by quantitative monitoring. But what's all the fuss about? 
we, we know that if the train of four um, is ratio is less than 0.9, patients experience increased risk and some important stuff. Um, you know, we don't have many of our patients do PFTs post-op, but airway obstruction, aspiration, um, et cetera, and even unpleasant symptoms of muscle weakness, which could affect whether they feel like getting out of bed to chair and getting on their recovery course. Um, we also talk about timing. People say, well, you know what, uh, Dr. Geiger is going to tuck the arms. I can't use it. What you can do is, is calibrate it up front and really just have it on at the beginning. And then if it's there, you, don't, you can use somewhere else during the case for monitoring how many twitches they have. But getting to the train of four ratio and confirming that after reversal, you have a train of four ratio greater than 0.9, that's associated with the best outcomes. And really, you only need those two time points. So should I use quantitative neuromuscular blockade monitoring and reversal? Uh, the answer there, like with uh, Decadron, is yes as well, you should. We have the monitors available. I realize in OR23 recently, there was one that was uh, non-functional. But this should be something just like putting on a pulse ox that we work into our standard workflow. Normovolemia. Um, basically, the take home here is that we should target a preoperative near zero fluid balance. Evidence for that is high, and they have high for goal directed fluid therapy. Um, and these get a strong recommendation for zero fluid balance. Now, a note up here is that perioperative weight gain, the goal should be less than 2.5 kilograms. So, what I would say there is if, if you find yourself getting over more than two and a half liters positive in the OR when you account for blood loss and you account for urine output, you really need to be considering should I be going to um, a presser or maybe even an inotrope. Um, most of our patients in the OR uh, get about two liters of fluid and their net fluid is about 1500 cc's um, plus or minus a little by the end uh, of the operating room and they tend to get total um, somewhere between four and 4,500, four liters and 4,500 cc's uh, within the first 24 hours. Now the question also comes down to advanced hemodynamic monitoring. This was proposed in 2006, which is that if, I, if this is my fluid load and this is my risk for uh, uh, perioperative complications, if I give too little, I have a ischemic complications. If I give too much, I have edematous complications. And so there's a bit of a Goldilocks principle here. Um, and that was proposed in 2006. And a decade later, <clears throat> this is from a retrospective study, but from about um, 500,000 uh, colorectal cases and hip and knee cases across the country, they, they looked at the volume of fluid that people got and found that those in the lowest quartile and those in the highest quartile sort of matched what was proposed as a hypothesis in 2006. This data is not prospective RCT, but it's very large population-based data that seem to bear out and consistent with length of stay, total cost, and post-op ileus. Um, to go through this quickly, obviously, we really want to take into account not only what we're putting in, i.e. the amount of fluid, um, but what's our vascular tone and what is our blood flow? So really looking at preload, afterload, and contractility. I think one thing that's important is we tend to think about this is what the patient looks like pre-induction. We induce them uh, and cause vasodilatation. And, and so we're seeing that there's basically now we see the, the pressure go down and we could either respond by giving more volume or giving vasopressors. And historically, with bowel preps and long fasting periods, et cetera, patients may come in significantly hypovolemic. Now, as um, our surgeons are using um, different bowel preps than the old Nichols prep that used to be used, and we're encouraging patients to drink all the way till two hours before surgery, really this should be more related to anesthesia, not bowel prep. Now, it's always good to ask the patient, did your bowel prep, if you had one, did it make you nauseous? Have you been able to drink? Did you drink your carbohydrate drinks? If the answer to all those is no, volume may very well be the answer, but we wanna be careful to not be treating the hypotension with lots of volume boluses that once they're restored back to this state uh, post-operatively, they then get, get into edematous states, uh, particularly in their lungs and in their gut, um, and in their gut around where the anastomoses could be. If you look at systematic reviews of all the goal-directed uh, fluid therapy, um, from 2017 and 2018. Really, the take home is the Goldilocks rule um, avoid volume overload, which, if you think of 2.5 kilograms in our fluids, that's basically two and a half liters. 
Um, the relief trial, a major prospective RCT did say that being too restrictive can be bad. And so, so we want to be careful there, or at least it looks like it can have an effect, um, not necessarily on long-term disability, but on um, kidney injury. Avoiding hypotension, um, we should not skate near the edge. I would argue that we should have a MAP target goal of 70 for everyone because less than 65 is, has been clearly associated with harm. And that may even be a higher target needed in the chronic hypertensive. Um, the NPRESS trial said that we should be targeting systolic blood pressure within 10% of baseline. That trial is not perfect at all, but it's some of the best evidence we currently have. And probably what that does is they put patients on pressors early is it probably avoided some of the hypotensive swings uh, that we see if we're only using repeated um, presser boluses. Um, so early presser use after initial IV fluids, most of these trials, patients were getting 500 or so cc's up front um, before they went on any sort of vasopressor infusion. Uh, really paying attention to patients, and this would be your higher risk patient for bigger surgeries if they're having um, a low cardiac output, uh, tends to be measured by an index less than 2.5, not being afraid to go on an inotrope, and advanced monitoring in open surgery and for sicker patients is likely to be a benefit. Um, and so I'll talk about that a bit more because you say you have this goal-directed fluid therapy, goal-directed hemodynamic therapy debate, so what? None of those studies were done in an enhanced recovery pathway like ours. And so if you look at our outcomes here, yes, we had better length of stay and all these other things I've talked about, we've actually shown a significantly reduced SSI rate. This is our cohort versus a national cohort before ERAS and after. And the same thing before and after with end organ complications. So sepsis, transfusions, uh, UTIs, pulmonary complications, et cetera. Um, we, our transfusions didn't really change, which we didn't expect them to. And this is a little bit of an optical illusion. Our AKI rate went from about 1.4 to 1.7. It was not statistically different. After the relief trial, it was important that we looked at that. But it seems that our outcomes are pretty good already, even without having to put a monitor on everyone. Um, but what we did is we, we tested that in a pre-post study. And basically, our algorithm was similar to what's been used before. I know this looks complex. To simplify it, it means that we address preload, we address whether they needed an inotropic agent, and we address afterload in that same model that I had talked about before. And the take-home message is, even though in open cases it even looked like there was a, a, a evidence here, this is only a trend. It is not statistically different or all complications. But open cases and sicker patients did have significantly higher SSI and complication rates. And so it may be that it advanced monitor, um, but because this was a pre-post study and RCTs have shown some benefit, but outside of ERAS pathways, it could be that something like a, um, a LIDCO or, or other type of continuous cardiac output monitor could make a difference. So what's the right approach? I think this paper from Bob Thiele in 2016 really gets it. If you're having minimally invasive surgery with little blood loss in a pretty healthy patient, just standard stuff. If you're having open surgery with more likelihood for blood loss and fluid shifts, maybe an A-line and monitoring SVV. Um, also, even minimally invasive surgery and in a sicker patient who may have a history of heart failure or other things, considering that same type monitoring. And then only for the very few patients that are both having open surgery and are your sicker patients, would you consider something like continuous cardiac output. To keep moving forward, um, reliable temperature uh, should be done. Maintenance of normothermia is high. Monitoring of temperature we should do. Um, and recommendation grade here is strong. Pre-warming is, is not as strong of, of evidence. And where this really started with a, a paper out of Dan Sessler's group by Andrea Kurtz back in 96, they did a prospective RCT. Interestingly, the mean difference between the warmed group was 36.6 versus 34.7. And so what, what this would suggest is actually it's avoiding significant hypothermia that's the problem, not necessarily having to maintain normothermia. But what's really important is it's in this intraoperative period that you see a huge separation and it can take people a number of hours post-op um, to get back to normal. Um, and other studies have replicated this. Some of our own data said that maybe temperature monitoring isn't as important, 
but we would definitely recommend that we continue um, to try to keep patients warm and certainly that we aren't doing what we used to do where we let patients drift a bit um, and that we're, we're definitely targeting a higher temperature. You've probably seen this floating around. I'm not going to go through all of this, but that's where our goal for a temperature greater than 36 comes from. This is referenced in our pathways. I'm not going to go into oxygenation right now, but if high FiO2 matters, the only subgroup it appears to matter in is colorectal. And data has clearly shown now that other subgroups, um, it does not benefit them. There's never been shown any harm, but there does not appear to be any benefit by higher FiO2s. If we look at the multimodals, um, the quality of evidence around avoiding opioids and applying multimodals is moderate. The um, recommendation grade is strong. To dial into that a bit, uh, the quality of evidence for epidurals in open surgeries is very high, and the recommendation is strong. The quality of evidence for lidocaine infusions improving outcomes is high, recommendation is strong. Ketamine was not included in these, but I'll talk about it a little bit. And the quality of evidence for tap blocks in laparoscopic surgery is moderate with a recommendation being strong. Of note, the evidence for epidurals in laparoscopic surgery is not there. The only time that we really use those is if someone is a severe chronic pain patient or they're really near a pulmonary cripple and, and we think just in case they open or to try to, to limit opioids as much as possible, we want to use the epidural. Um, so. Our program here as a whole currently, we see about 2,700 patients a year. We've had significant reductions in length of stay and cost, but related to multimodal, what I wanna talk about is we've had over an 80% decrease intraoperatively, postoperatively, and over two thirds decrease at discharge with better outcomes. So to review that evidence again, um, combining NSAIDs and Tylenol, will give you 30 to 50% reduction in opioid use. Gabapentinoids is about 30%. TAPS um, is better um, than uh, for pain than wound infiltration in laparoscopic epidurals for open. Um, lidocaine infusions have better outcomes on decreasing opioid use, um, probably decreasing return of bowel function time and shortening length of stay. Dexamethasone, as we talked about at 0.1 mg per kg, reduces pain, also reduces PONV. Um, ketamine can uh, decrease opioid use, appears to be dose dependent, um, and tramadol, uh, we use some post-op. Uh, you won't see that as much intraoperatively. Now, coming to the end, can you use NSAIDs in the COVID era and don't surgeons hate them anyhow? We actually studied that here. And um, basically the outcome in a study uh, is retrospective, but in 877 patients, no um, association with AKI, return to OR, readmission, or leak. Um, and so the, the outcome with one of our surgeons was recognizing the significant benefit of Tordal. Its appropriate use appears safe. Um, someone brought up um, this in the, there was one letter in Lancet Respiratory Medicine in March, and basically this has been debunked, and the FDA, CDC, WHO all now recognize that there's no evidence behind limiting NSAIDs. Um, so uh, what I would say though is colorectal, yes. Small bowel, yes. If you're up, we, we don't use them for bariatrics routinely and anything in the foregut where there's an anastomosis around here. So this isn't in lap coles, you can use it there, but you have concern for marginal ulcerations or leaks up here. And so we do uh, in pathways that involve surgery in the, the foregut, we aren't currently using them. Should I employ all of the non-opioid multimodal analgesics detailed in the ERAS protocols? Should I run the tech intra-op? And can I run a lidocaine infusion with an epidural in place? The answer to all those is yes, and we would request that you would. Um, Jim Blair could talk to you about the fact of, of lidocaine infusions. They actually work differently than an epidural does, and so the effects, um, pain, and probably um, inflammation are of benefit to run while the epidural is in place. We don't run both on the floor, just so you know, though. What if we run out of Alaris tubing? Um, one, if that happens, we'll alert everyone. Um, we will then no longer use ketamine or lidocaine infusions. We won't uh, do TIVA cases unless it's indicated for a you know, patient risk issue. And then we're gonna switch to structured IV methadone um, dosing uh, in the OR. We're, we're not having to do that at this point, but we'll have a plan in place if that's to happen. And 
People have said, do we have enough propofol for Tiva? Short answer right now is yes. Raj Gupta and Christina Hayhurst have been doing a good job keeping us informed as well as folks from pharmacy. Um, so if it's specified to use, please keep using it. Um, there, you could consider it in colorectal surgery that's for cancer. There's some association um, with better outcomes there. Um, if we run into a shortage, we will not use it in ERS care pathways anymore. Only propofol only done as indicated. Also, I looked this up last night. There's a little evidence in PEDS. I can only find one study in lap coli where this subhypnotic propofol infusions, kind of background propofol, um, uh, is used. And that, that has crept in. And right now, that's, that is using more propofol and more tubing. And we aren't in danger in either of those, but there's actually just no evidence, not even low quality evidence that, uh, that I could find that it's beneficial. If someone out there routinely uses that and prescribes it and knows based on a number of studies that that's recommended, please send those to me um, so we could uh, get that evidence included. Now, the hospital now wants an ear ask for all program, basically such that enhanced recovery after surgery um, becomes recovery after surgery or enhanced becomes expected. And this is related to reducing clinical variation where possible and improving margin, as I talked about before. I'm not gonna go through all of these numbers, but you're seeing there's fairly large numbers here, um, some yet undefined that we think could have better um, contribution margin to the hospital on an annualized basis. And if you look at where we are, um, we have lots of these moving forward um, with colorectal, um, bariatrics, OBGYN, um, the spine team, they've done a great job, um, but with all of the pain stuff and their, and so what we're doing with the perioperative consult service with them may move forward, but this has done really well. Um, it's fully implemented from the, the pain components. We have some other things that we can do, but you can see this is a huge system where we could use people's help. Now, to go back to this slide earlier, it's a good news story, but during COVID or after, I think we have the opportunity if compliance goes down, we could see length of stay go up, or we could go the other way and continue to have improved compliance, hitting that reach target, and hopefully seeing our length of stay as a metric, just one metric, but continuing to go down. So if, if you look at this over here, this was January through March. Um, this is in COVID. And in COVID, if you go back here again, 1.79, 4.22, you see our CMI adjusted resource length of stay got better. And our average, not even our median, our median is down in the, the 3.2, 3.4 range, but our average continues to get better even in the era of COVID. And so the work that everyone's doing in the OR is, is noticed and is making a big difference to patients. Now, future direction. Um, we want to continue to generate evidence to turn that into actionable knowledge like we talked about this morning, have clinical adoption and improve patient outcomes. Um, one thing is that we know our recipe is better than the traditional anesthetic, but we don't know which components matter. And when we talk about these different components for us in particular, we're going to start to do a series of prospective RCTs. Um, Brittany Raymond is leading the way on this, and the first one is going to be randomizing patients to ketamine versus no ketamine, and that'll be coming in the, in the months uh, to come. So the summary is compliance is associated with improved meaningful outcomes. Currently, no changes are necessary related to COVID, so please use all of these components. Um, our outcomes will continue to improve over time. I want to thank everyone because what you do in the OR matters tremendously, and we need your help. And I'm now happy to take uh, any questions. And if I will start going through these. Um, so with the fact that we don't want to give benzos for colorectal surgery, but we do abdominal wall blocks, should we move towards a world where these are post-induction? Um, I would love that. Uh, and we, we will need some training in order to get there. But I think that's a great question from Raj. And so... Um, stay tuned for that. Um, Ted Yagmore and I and Brian Allen have been talking about that. And so if you would be, uh, we would like to get everyone trained to be able to do, um, or as many people as possible trained to be able to do good truncal blocks. And so that's a great point. Um, one person said it's important to distinguish between BIS and other EEG, raw or otherwise. That's true. So um, the evidence is that if you can look at the raw tracing or look at something like suppression ratio, 
um, that that is the, the, the piece of EEG right now that is probably the strongest associated with outcomes, whereas it's not the same, that is not the same as a BIS score. Um, what's the value of albumin versus crystalloid in a fluid restricted model of care? Does albumin provide better perfusion outcomes when volume is given? So there's no evidence currently in these cases uh, in particular, unless you're talking about potentially in liver cases and certainly in one, someone who's hypoalbuminemic, there's some evidence. But in these cases, there is no evidence that um, any of the colloids matter. And so big trials that have just come out, the FLASH trial in January of 2020 was a major prospective RCT comparing um, volubin or a starch uh, versus crystalloid, and there was no, no improvement in outcomes. Um, albumin itself, um, there's no evidence for uh, in this. And so at this point, I would say we, we can't say that going to albumin has any evidence and certainly has a big cost implication. Um, uh, Jerry said, what about the use of alpha-2 agonist as an additive uh, for patients with alcohol abuse or drug abuse? Absolutely. Um, ha didn't have the time to, to go into that. Presidex is discussed. The evidence is probably moderate at best. What everyone notes is that a multimodal approach that avoids um, opioids is the, the key piece with the caveat that there's really good evidence for epidurals and open, really good evidence for lidocaine, um, and pretty good evidence for truncal blocks. As far as the oral or IV medicines that we're using, alpha-2 agonists absolutely are an appropriate choice, um, particularly in the patients that you described, and particularly with alcohol or drug abuse, um, as you, uh, and continuing that into the PACU can be a really good thing. Um, any possibility of getting the neuromuscular monitoring device currently in use in the OR in MCE? Um, and also, can we know the availability of BIS monitors in all locations? Uh, Mark or Warren, are you on to be able to help tackle that? Uh, this is, this is, This is Warren. Uh, so we're talking about uh, capital acquisition, uh, and the answer, the short answer is yes. The long answer is uh, if we have uh, a shortage of uh, neuromuscular blockade monitors or level of consciousness monitoring, uh, we will actually have to work through the process of submitting a capital request and getting it approved. But that is definitely doable. So uh, I think um, the first move for us would be to do an assessment to figure out whether uh, whether we're missing monitors and how many we're missing. Uh, and then put that into the process. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Blair, who knows more about lidocaine and um, uh, neural monitoring, neuromonitoring and cortical, monitoring cortical activity than anyone I know, um, is commented that there's been problems with the BIS and just monitoring frontal activity and with the advent of said line, we can probably see some improvements uh, and so that's something that uh, should be coming our way. Um, someone said, this is obviously effective and easy to do. What excuses are people giving for being non-compliant? Can we debunk those? I'm not, I'm not sure what that refers to, um, but I actually think doing all these care components takes a decent bit of effort but I think that the more that we do them, it becomes very feasible um, to do them. And, and from a non-compliance perspective, if, if there are things that you identify other than just doing these care components that you say, our workspace, workplace, workflow make it really hard for me to be compliant, please let us know because that's super important to hear about. Um, got a question. Have you looked at incidence of delirium in the ketamine cohorts? We aren't routinely recording um, delirium on the floor. We, as we round on all of these patients on the periop service, um, we do uh, certainly do routine um, assessments of them daily. And I, I cannot quote specific data to you. I would probably look at the Avidan trial um, as maybe the closest. They only used a single intraop bolus, but showed no difference with ketamine versus not. Uh, maybe some more vivid dreams. Um, but we do every day ask people um, if they have any visual uh, hallucinations, and if so, are they bothersome to them? Um, 
And uh, as far as actually using something like they do in the ICU with a CAM score, we're working towards doing that. Um, so I got something, uh, the retrospective study you quoted showed a threefold increase in the point estimate of AKI risk that in, um, some other groups have reported an increase in AKI with their ERS protocols is it fair to conclude that NSAIDs are safe in this context? That's why we looked at our own data. Um, we have a very low AKI rate, um, and this is one of the things that is, is followed routinely. And at Vanderbilt, 100% of our cases are sampled for NISQIP reporting, and that's followed. Um, so Ben or Tim, if you're on and you want to comment, you can, but that, that, that was exactly why we wanted to follow that, particularly in light of the relief trial, um, because we, with the, the long-term implications that appear to be coming out with AKI, we want to be very careful. And if you look at the relief trial, the restrictive group got 3.7 liters median over the first 24 hours. The liberal group got six liters. Um, we end up... Um, a, probably midway in between, um, kind of in that four to four and a half liters, and we're not seeing an increase in our AKI rates. Um, and Ben or Tim, if you're still on, do you want to comment? I, Sorry, Matt. I, I took... Go ahead, Ben, Tim. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry, I had technical difficulties. I didn't understand the question. Um, our, We've looked at our data and someone was talking about how we are concerned about AKI. Other studies have noticed with restrictive fluids and NSAIDs that there could be an increase in AKI. Based on our sampling of data here, um, what are we seeing currently? Currently, we don't, we don't see any change in AKI and we haven't even with, uh, with good smart use of Tordol, even with fluid restrictions. It, as long as we make sure the patient is euvolemic and we're smart about what we're doing, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't affect that as an outcome. It's when you make blanket statements that, oh, we should keep it at 800 cc's of fluid and we don't use good management judgment. That's when we run into trouble. Yeah, and and, and again, noting that we sample 100% of our patients here for data reporting. And I would note, if a patient says, I tried that prep, I was throwing up all night, I haven't had anything to drink since 4 p.m. yesterday, that is gonna be a different patient intraoperatively. Um, and so to Tim's point, our goal is not to say, even though we know our median fluid is intraoperatively is about two liters, um, that doesn't mean you have to stick to that. We, we definitely want you to, the goal is to target euvolemia and normotension, even if we're using pressors. And, and that seems to have kept our AKI right, rate exceedingly low. Um, last question, someone said, to rephrase, why aren't we at 100% compliance? Um, the way that we pull the data, it's really difficult to code whether a patient could legitimately not get a care component. For instance, if we, and we wanna be careful that if we expect 100% compliance, I think we will get malicious obedience from the same point of fine, you told me to do it, I'm doing it in everybody. And because that's not a system that's, that's fun to be in. We've got data that I think we can show that, that shows this is better, it's better for the patient, um, I think as clinicians, we can feel better about the care we provide and quite, and it is better for the hospital system um, and allows us to grow programs like we want to and do capital investments like Warren just talked about. But um, the idea that every care component should always apply to every patient, we do have certain patients who write back in and say, hey, you know, I was happy with my care last time, but I didn't like that ketamine. Well, if a patient tells you that in pre-op, it's totally legitimate to say, you know what, um, I've got a, a patient reported outcome to a piece of our care. I'm not going to give that. So we don't want to ding someone for that, if that makes sense. All right, we're over time, although I'm excited to see there's still 100 people logged in. Um, Warren, any closing comments or uh, Tim or Ben, thank you for tuning in. Do y'all have anything from the uh, surgeon's perspective to, uh, to comment on? I'll defer to our surgical colleagues. Thank you very much, Matt, for the nice summary. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I'll just I'll just make one quick comment, um, and that's that you know you've shown some great data about how we continue to improve as an organization, how we care for our patients. Um, and and you can't publish this because I would lose my job. But if you've noticed, the surgeons don't change. 
Um, the techniques don't change, but their patients get better. And I think that really shows the importance of everything that is done in the perioperative period and how everything matters in the outcome of the patient. It's not, it's not the surgeon, it's not the surgery, it's the team that makes it work. And so I really appreciate everybody's help on that. I would wholeheartedly yeah. agree. And I'd like to second that for the, the third time. I think, um, you know, over the past 10 years, we've really realized that what happens in the operating room is not predicated just on what happens on our side of the with their screen, but on the head of the bed as well. And I think, uh, you know, you can't always see the gains that are made by following these protocols, but our patients go home faster, they recover faster, they go back to work, they're happier. It's, uh, it really, really, really works. So thank you all. And Alex, do you want you you actually did the data analysis for the the paper and the AKI question came up. Do do you want to anything else you would add about you know toradol use, where we are with fluids, the data that you're seeing for our group on the whole? You know, I think the central thrust of our our um, toradol paper. So first of all, with the the overall ERAS paper, we saw our our AKI was flat. So even in a fluid restrictive strategy, we certainly didn't increase our AKI rate. And I took that as encouraging that, um, you know, we, we, uh, we certainly didn't add on any more extra AKIs from uh, instituting an ERAS policy. The takeaway from the, the Tordal paper is that, um, you know, when we're thoughtful about it, when we use it within a, uh, a structured um, protocolized system, it, it's very safe and very effective. And we showed that both as an astomotic leak, which is really important to us, and AKI, which is really important to, to kind of everyone, um, neither of those things moved um, with, with Toradol versus not with Toradol. Awesome. Well, thank you to everybody. I hope you have a wonderful Friday. Um, stay safe and stay well, and uh, have a great weekend. Let's get those patients in the room. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye.